In today's video, we are going to go through the step-by-step -step procedure for defining a loss project in R and visualizing the results. The practical example that we are going to use for this uh, in this tutorial is actually uh, documented in R's manual, but today we are going to go to do this live in R. So before I start by opening R, I will start first by uh, giving an overview of this uh, project so uh, typically you would have something similar uh, when you are trying to use R. So what we have here is basically a four-story uh, office building that has been designed in downtown Los Angeles, California. You can see the coordinates over here. So this building has been designed according to uh, ASC 7-10 so this is the 2010 version of the American building code the building as you see from the plan view it has a regular uh, rectangular plan layout and it has two perimeter special steel moment resisting frames in each orthogonal direction so those are the ones that you see here in bold black lines. The rest of the building, the interior of the building, is being, uh, you will find the gravity framing system, which is carrying the gravity loads, which consists of a combination of gravity columns and gravity beams that are connected together with uh, conventional uh, gravity shear connections. Uh, the building, you can see here some of the seismic design parameters used for the, <clears throat> for the design uh, of this building. Over here, you can see the elevation view of the building uh, with uh, the section uh, sizes, which are all white flange uh, cross sections for the perimeter uh, moment frame and the interior gravity frame. Uh, so... This building, we, uh, after we designed this building, we uh, created uh, two-dimensional non-linear numerical models in open seas. And uh, then we conducted non-linear dynamic analysis in open seas. We, for that, we used the far-field ground motion set, which, uh, can be, which is described and can be found in FEMA P695. So this ground motion set includes uh, a total of 44 ground motion records. So these records uh, were applied to the two-dimensional uh, numerical models uh, to get the structure response of the building. We actually did this analysis three times. So we scaled the ground motion records to three seismic intensities, which is basically three uh, stripes, analysis stripes. Uh, if you want to read more about the details of the building design and uh, the numerical model uh, specifics, uh, you can look into this uh, reference over here. You can also download the actual OpenSeas numerical model, uh, which is publicly available in GitHub using the link below. Again, these are ready to run models, so you can use them to run any types of ground motions or to re-reproduce the, the structure response that we used uh, in this example. Uh, over here, I also uh, summarize some of the structure components and the other structure components in the building. And this is something that you will all also need to do before you conduct a loss assessment project. You need to have a summary or understanding of what types of structure components and non-structure components inside the building. Specifically, you want to know what are the different types of these components and how many units for each type at each different story or floor. Uh, so uh, if you look here quickly, you can see that uh, structure components, you have like uh, 20 gravity columns, white flange gravity columns, every story, in each direction, in each orthogonal direction, meaning uh, you have RBS connections, reduced beam section connections, uh, you have eight 
uh, double-sided connections per floor per direction. You have four single-sided per floor per direction. Uh, similarly, you can find like 48 shear connections per floor per direction. So those are the ones that are connecting the gravity framing system. You also have column splices. You have eight column splices per orthogonal direction uh, at the third story. So if you count here, I have one, two, three, four. So this is in this uh, special moment frame, but also if you look at the other special moment frame behind it, because in each orthogonal direction you have two. So basically you have a total of eight column splices. In the same time, I'm assuming here a number of non-structure components in the building. So for instance, uh, I'm assuming that we have a corrugated floor slab uh, in each floor. I'm assuming that you have drywall partitions and drywall finishing. Uh, I'm not writing the, the entire description here of the finish or the partition uh, type because there are many types of drywall partitions, but these are going to go through uh, once we start defining the actual components, like what's the ID for this component and what's the description for this component more specifically. But in general, we have drywall partitions and drywall finishes at each story, at all grid lines. So at every grid line, we have drywall. I'm assuming that we have drywall partitions and finishing. I'm also assuming that we have suspended ceiling in each floor throughout the entire area. I'm also assuming automatic sprinklers that we have 3,300 feet of piping per floor. I'm assuming also for the exterior glazing that we have 216 uh, uh, panels per story. I'm also assuming that in this building is being serviced by two hydraulic elevators. So now knowing those, uh, right now of course I'm, I'm not, you may notice that I'm not defining any other building contents like furniture or uh, since this is an office building, maybe you can include some furniture, some uh, office uh, environment uh, contents like computers or such uh, to include as part of your loss assessment. But over here to simplify things, I'm just only including structure components and non-structure components. So right now, from this uh, small summary, I have uh, an understanding of my building, the geometric attributes of the building, the contents of the building. I already ran the analysis myself, the nonlinear analysis, so I have the results for the dynamic analysis. I'm going to show this in a second. Uh, and I have everything ready so I can go ahead and uh, try to input all this data in R and run the loss assessment and see what will be, uh, which components will be damaged, what are all the consequences uh, at these three seismic intensities. So I will minimize this one and then I will go ahead and start err. So I have the shortcut here on the desktop, so right now I'm opening err. So now that err is open, so the first thing that you need to do, of course, we are starting a new project. So I'll go ahead and click on new. I'll save my project in uh, on uh, the desktop. So I'll go on the desktop and I will call this example building. Uh, for my units, I'm going to choose uh, Imperial units for this project. So now that this building, this project has been initialized, you will see right here on the desktop that you have right now this uh, MATLAB uh, file that has been created, which will contain basically all the project definition. Uh, so let me move it uh, here at the top. So the first thing right now, you can see that right now I have this button now, uh, it says red and it says that uh, status not defined. So this is the building data. So this is the first step that I will need to do is to define the building data. So I will go ahead and click on that. So 
right here you can provide uh, this is optional you can provide a building description so this is something for you that when you get back uh, to your project you understand that what kind of uh, project is this what did you do exactly so you can write any type of description this is also will help you when you this also will help you if you are uh, doing the reporting uh, later on uh, the reporting options of the data so this will be uh, written in the report the building description so here I will going to say that this is uh, four story. Building with steel moment frames. Now, of course, you can be more elaborate than this in your description, but this is uh, this is the thing that I will write over here. The second thing that I will need to define is the occupancy. Again, this is optional. The occupancy, uh, whatever you choose here, this will. Uh, control basically the population model so the number of people and uh, how many people through the day or through the year or uh, are in the building at any given time so this will be defined based on your selection right here so you can read more about this occupancy categories and the associated population models from uh, FEMA P58 documentation. So right here, since this is an office building, I'm going to use or select, sorry, a commercial office. For the construction material, again, uh, here, this selection only will help you later on when you define component data. So instead of, if you have a building that's made out of steel only, then when you go into the component, defining the component data, instead of scrolling through the entire component database you just are going to go browse through only the steel components that are relevant uh, to your building so right here i'm going to select steel again this will not affect many things but it will make your life easier if you have this selection correct uh, the same thing for the structure system again this is also to simplify your selection from the database later on so I'm going to select special moment frame because this is the case uh, in my example. The number of story, we said that this is a four story building, so I'm going to put four over here. Then I will need to enter the footprint area. And again, if I open, if I open my example again, so you can see that this uh, building has a footprint area of 140 feet by 100 feet so this gives us 14,000 square feet for the footprint area now if I click here to define the total floor area basically I need to multiply these values since this is a regular building along the height so I need to multiply this by so if I click here, it, it automatically, uh, ERC automatically compute this value. Of course, you can modify it later on if you want. After this, I need to define the replacement cost and the demolition cost. And these are uh, things that I didn't uh, show here in this summary, but these are also two important uh, values that you need to know. So basically, this is written in the in ERC manual. So I'm going to... Uh, assume in this example that the replacement cost which is basically the cost of replacing the entire building or constructing an actual building that's for a story with all these specifics that it costs 15 million dollars for the demolition cost i'm going to assume that the cost for demolishing the building and removing the debris and such that it will cost $2 million. Again, this is again up to you and up to the case or the, the, uh, the case study that you are uh, trying to analyze. So now that everything is, has been defined in the building data module, then I will click Submit. 
once you do that so now this uh, turns uh, green and now you have the component data uh, button become active as you see over here and still says status not defined you will see also that right here the damage fragility button became active and the population model button became active because we said the population model now has been defined by association because we already defined the occupancy of the building so the population model has been automatically uh, populated in a sense so if I click actually on the population model you can see that by default all these tables here were populated by the values that are being extracted from the FEMA P58 library so it's telling me here that the peak occupancy inside this building is essentially four people per thousand square feet and the variation in this number the four people you can see it in these tables here so this is by hour and by day and over here in this table you can see the variation in this peak occupancy by month uh, and again you can modify these values if you want uh, you are able to do that directly by modifying the values in the table that's fine the evaluation time so this is again when you run the analysis the loss assessment analysis uh, during the Monte Carlo simulation procedure uh, the time in order to evaluate if any injuries or casualties occurred due to at a given seismic intensities uh, that evaluation time will be done in a random process so the month will be selected randomly the day and the hour will be selected randomly if you want to evaluate this for a specific month for a specific day for a specific hour let's say that you want to select this always for the highest occupancy so you want to uh, do this analysis in October uh, during a weekday at uh, let's say at 1 p.m. so you can select here defined and then you can select the, the exact time but over here I will keep it as random you can also click visualize to see how this population model looks like so this is how it looks like again population the population for people per hundred thousand square feet you can see here the variations with respect to the day of the time or with respect to the year you can see here two lines in each plot one for the weekday and one for the weekend so I'll close this everything looks good and you can click submit or even if you closed it since you didn't change anything so that's fine I'll just click submit that's fine uh, damage fragility again this became active because right now the next main step that we need to do is to define the component data and in order to define the component data maybe you are going to define some uh, components so these components some of them are already can be found inside the FEMA P58 uh, database if you have a new component that's not included in the FEMA P58 database then you can click on the damage fragility module and perhaps add a new uh, univariate fragility or if you want to import uh, a modified database you can do this as well or you can also edit the value of the, the, the integrated uh, component database so you can open it and let's say that you you have a component that's already defined in the FEMA P58 database like a drywall partition but the value for repairing a specific damage state is a bit low and you want to increase it so you can modify this directly here since this is not the case in this example that I'm showing right here so I will close this one and I will go directly to defining the component data so I will click on that 
So as we mentioned in the quick overview uh, tutorial videos that you have three uh, ways to define the component data. You can define this manually. You can define it using uh, the loss EDB functions. But since I already know in my building the types and number of structure and non-structure components, I already know that. So I will use the first option, which is the manual definition. So I will select this, and then I will click Next. Now I need to enter to err basically the list of uh, components that I have, uh, the non-structure and the structure ones, and contents, if you have contents like furniture and others. There are two ways to do this. So you can import this directly from Excel, from a preformatted Excel file, or you can uh, start using these drop-down menus to uh, browse for specific components, and by specifying the location, type, and number of units, you can start by adding one by one each component. Uh, now, this way could could be a little bit uh, tedious or could take some time because you will start adding uh, each component one by one. So it may be easier, especially if you are running multiple uh, uh, projects and you're modifying every time the component uh, definition, then it may be easier to use the preformatted uh, Excel file that's available with Air uh, doc uh, supporting documents to define directly everything in this Excel file and just import the data right away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use this import from Excel option. So I need to open this Excel file and start adding the data in this Excel file. So I will go to err that I downloaded, all the data that I downloaded from the GitHub repository. I will go inside the docs folder, supporting documents folder, and then I will need to open the template component data file over here. So I will go ahead and open the template component data Excel file. And as you see, this file, this template, it has already the data actually for this specific example project already defined, but in general case, you will need to modify these values according to your specific uh, project. Uh, but here we are going to go through actually all these numbers and what do they represent. So first of all, in this uh, preformatted Excel file, you have two sheets. The first one is called component data, where you need uh, basically to fill out the first four columns based on your uh, project to define the components. For each component, you need to define to specify the component ID in the first column, then the level of the component, where, it, where is it located, is it at the floor or at the story. Then you need to specify the location, if it's at a typical floor, typical story, or at a specific story or floor. Then you need to provide the number of units or the, of this component, or the length of this component, or the area being serviced by this component, as we are going to see in a second. The second uh, uh, Excel sheet here inside, it's called database, and this one, if you click on it, you will see uh, a filtered or uh, summarized summary of the database, the component database uh, from FEMA P58, summarized over here. So from this list, you can look up the specific component that you want to add and you can look up its ID, you can see uh, uh, basically the number of damage state for this component, what is the controlling engineering demand parameter for this component, uh, how is the costing being set uh, and its category and 
the component basically a name, short name. So assuming that for this example, so the first thing that you need to do is basically look for each component that you have inside your building and then you look into this database so let me split the screen like this so you need to look for each component you need to look it inside this database and find the ID of this component so this is the second step that you need to do once you have the IDs then you start going to the component underscore data sheet and start adding this component IDs so let me give you an example so for instance we have here the shear connection we have the shear connections so we have 48 units of shear connections per floor per direction so first thing I need to find what is the ID of this component the component that's called shear connection so if I go into my database so by luck it's actually the first component so the first component in the database if I zoom a bit you will see that the first component is component ID 1 and the description is basically bolted shear tap gravity connection uh, you can if you go to the full documentation of the database which is also provided with early you can read more about uh, the damage states that are being defined the fragility damage states that are being defined for this component so essentially you have four damage states then that it includes like the yielding of the connection uh, buckling of the shear plate uh, fracture of the bolts and so on and this connection uh, is being controlled by the storage drift ratio and is being uh, the costing is based on one connection so if I go to my component data let's assume that I don't have these values defined yet So right now, let's say that you have an empty row, the first row is empty. You are going to say, okay, I need to insert component ID number one. So because this is the ID of the component, and then I click enter. Once you click that, then in the Excel sheet, it automatically looks up component ID number one and provides you with the component name and the cost unit in the last uh, column the one that's called comment you can add any type of uh, comment for yourself so I can say that this is the shear connection for example these are the shear connections so now I define the component ID for the level I know from my definition let me now split again so I know that this shear connections we have they are present per floor per direction so the level is floor. the location is every floor so I would write typical then I will need to specify the number of unit and if I click here it says uh, values must be specified in the same units of the project but this is not important here because we are going to specify the number of units directly because as we said the costing for this component is based on one connection so for instance the fragility it will is it's telling me that it will cost let's say one thousand dollars to repair the damage in one connection so this means that here I need to provide the number of connections. There are some other cases that the costing is not based on the unit. So then you need to define something else as I'm going to demonstrate here. So right now we already know that we have 48 units per floor per direction. So I will go ahead and write 48. So that's it. With this I defined the shear connection component. Okay, 
Let's take the second one actually right here, which is the column splices. So we said we have eight column splices at the third story in each direction. So I will go to the database again. I need to look at the component that says column splice. And actually, if I scroll, you will see that this is the one that I need. You have like three components defined here. You have three components from component ID5, ID6, ID7. They are all welded column splices. And let's say that this is the case, welded column splice and not bolted ones. And uh, the three components, the difference is, is basically the weight uh, of the column pounds per linear foot. So, for my given cross-section, the one that I'm using over here, uh, I'm going to select component number 6. So again, let's assume that you don't have this data defined yet. So then you are going to go and say component ID 6. The level, well, we said that this is at the third story, so I'm going to select story. It's not actually typically story, it's only present, this component's only present at the third story, so I'm going to write three. And then again, this component, the coating is based on a single a splice, so I just need to provide the number of splices, which in this case is eight. And now this is done. And then you keep going with the rest of the components. So right here, for instance, uh, component 86, which is post Northridge RBS connection, uh, double-sided, or and then which is the one defined here, and then I specify the number of connections and so on. Uh, if I scroll here down, uh, to, let's say now, let's go a bit to the non-structured components. So for the non-structured components, you will find that, uh, let's go with the first one defined here, which is the hydraulic elevator. So again, if you go to the database and you scroll to the, uh, through the database to find this component, uh, you will see that uh, the component that we would like to use is component ID 417. And this component description is basically a hydraulic elevator that uh, this definition applies to most California installations, 1976 or later. So this would be our case because we are looking uh, into basically a modern building. So I'm going to use component ID 417. I'm going to say that this is located at the, the level is the floor and I'm saying the location is one. Why one? You can write typical here, that will not be a problem, but actually this is a hydraulic elevator and uh, since the hydraulic elevator actually the, the controlling demand parameter is the peak ground acceleration which is only relevant at the ground level. So that's why here I'm adding the location as one, so at floor one, which is the ground level, essentially. And again, the costing for this elevator is per elevator or per unit. So this means that I just need to specify the number of elevators in the building, so I just put two, which is the number of elevators in my example. Now, let's go to the next one, which is the suspended ceiling. And we mentioned here that we have a suspended ceiling each floor throughout the entire area. So again, if you look through the database, you will see that the suspended ceiling, there are many entries for suspended ceiling, but the one that we are going to use is actually the one with component ID 412. 
So this suspended ceiling or this component is located at the floor level, at each floor level. So that's why I write typical right here. And then over here, you are not going to write the number. You are not going to input the number of suspended ceiling units unlike what we have done so far for all these structure components right here we are going to provide actually the area why is that because as you see here that's why you have the cost unit summary right here which is very very important in this case so the costing specified for the damage fragility for the suspended ceiling is based for every 2,500 square foot unit. So you need to find the total area that are being serviced by the suspended ceiling since the costing is based on a unit area, which is, sorry, which is the square foot over here. So this means I need to define the area for this suspended ceiling and this since this suspended ceiling as we mentioned in the definition is located at each floor throughout the entire area and we know already that the entire area which is the floor print area is 14,000 so 14,000 feet so I put 14,000 over here now what will happen that after you define this in early during the computation Erlo will eventually transform this 14,000 square foot into a number of units. So Erlo are going, is going to use this 14,000 and divided, divide this value by 2,500, which is the cost unit. And then this will provide Erlo with the number of the equivalent number of units. So it's very important to uh, know the cost unit for your component in order to define this value correctly. Uh, let's take uh, another example. Uh, so let's say for instance uh, if we go here to the fire uh, sprinklers so we mentioned in the definition that you have automatic sprinklers for those you have 3300 feet of piping per floor so if I look through the database again I find that it's component 569 that gives me the description that I want for this specific component and you can see the entire uh, description over here in the database so component ID 569, which is located at, at the floor level, at the typical floor level. And then before I specify this value, I need to look at the costing. And then if I look at the costing here, I see that the costing is based on 1,000 feet segments of pipe. So this means that the costing here is based on linear feet or unit length so this means that I need to provide here the length of the component and as I mentioned that I'm assuming there is 3300 feet of piping so I just need to enter 3300 which means that again later on in R it will compute the number of cost units for this component, the fire sprinkler, by dividing 3300 by 1000, which will give you 3.3, the equivalent number of cost units. So in general, uh, you will see that most of the components in the database are either based on a unit, or based on length, or based on unit area. So, based on a unit component, a unit length, or a unit area. So, depending on whatever is this costing unit, you need to define this value. 
So let's let's take another example to consolidate uh, our understanding of this again. So let's go with the wall partition. So as we mentioned uh, over here that we have wall dry wall partitions that are present at each story at all grid lines. So if I look in my database, I found that it's component 374 that provides me with the right description, which is a gypsum wall partition with wallpaper that's fixed at its base. It has like a slip track at the top and you can read the full description. That's fine. And now you will see here that Okay, so component ID 374, you enter the ID, then you say that it's present at each story, at each typical story, and then to provide this number, you need to look again at the cost unit. So the cost unit here for this partition, for this wall partition, is actually based on a panel that's 9 feet in height and 100 feet in length. So the cost unit here is based on 100 feet in length, which is the length of the panel. The height is not relevant in this case. So it's 100 feet in length. So this means that I need to provide here this value. It needs to be also in foot, which is the unit length. So how I came about by computing this 840? Well. I know that the drywall partition at each story at all grid lines. If I look in the plan view, I see that in one orthogonal direction, I have one, two, three, four, five, six grid lines. Each grid line is 140 feet in length. So that if you multiply six by 140, this gives you 840 feet, which means that in the background, during the analysis, R is going to divide this 840 feet by 100 feet, which will give R an equivalent of 8.4 units of wall partitions. So I hope that this is clear. Uh, again, if you are not sure about the costing unit, there is an easy way to do it by actually uh, uh, R. You can go, uh, if I close this one, you can go to the damage fragility. You can go to explore the fragility database. Actually, I recommend you to do this when you are looking up your components in the database. And let's say in this case, we were looking on the wall partition, which is 374. So if you go here and you write ID 374, So you see here that this is the wall partition, the type that we said. Uh, this component has only one damage state. The damage state is uh, description is shown over here, which is the wallpaper is warped and torn. This is what happened. And this will cost twenty seven hundred dollars. Let me zoom a bit. So this cost twenty seven hundred dollars to repair. And it says here that the median cost is per 100 feet length. So this means again that you need to provide the length for this component. Uh, if I put component number one, which is the gravity connection, if you remember. And let's, let's say zoom out. Uh, you will see again that here you go, you have four damage state defined for this a shear connection for this component. The description of each damage state is summarized over here. You can see the cost for each one, the median cost, and it says here that the median cost is per one unit. So this means that you need to define the number of units and so on and so on. So always try to check your component through this exploration module over here, this interface, to make sure that everything is uh, correctly defined before you proceed. Now let me close this and let me go back now to the component data. Now that everything 
has been defined in this Excel sheet so all what I need to do is to close it and save it I defined all my structure and non structure components uh, if you have other contents uh, you can start adding again ID component and then specifying these values and so on so I will close it and I will save it you can save it under any name it doesn't need to be called template component data you can save it under any name that's fine but for this example we're also also using this uh, already provided supporting document so I save it I go to the manual definition I say import from Excel uh, and uh, actually before I do that let me show you something let me before I do that let's do something so in this Excel file let's say that you don't have this entry this one so the final one which is component 771 uh, the corrugated slab let's say that you forgot to put this here so I will delete it I will close and save the file and then I will go to the component data manual definition The, the location where I have this saved I will select on template component data and then give it just a minute to load and then you can see here all the summary for the things that we defined in the Excel sheet has been imported to this table now at this point you remembered ah I forgot to define the uh, corrugated slab uh, component so you can go back to the Excel sheet, add the entry, and then import again. Or you can actually, since this is one component, you can actually add it directly using uh, the drop-down menus. So let's see how this works. So first I need to define the category of this component. So actually the corrugated slab is assigned to the interior category. So I will select interior. And then from the component data, I will scroll down and select corrugated slab over here and then notice that once you select something you will see that it automatically is telling you uh, what is the cost unit for this component and what do you need to do so right now it's telling me that the repair cost for this component is based on a predefined unit floor area of 10 point seven whatever feet square therefore the number of units will be calculated as the building floor area divided by the cost associated unit floor area so it's telling you here that you do not need to specify the number of units for this component because automatically the value of area has been automatically uh, generated here as 14,000 assuming that this component is present at the entire area of course you are being told here that you have the option to override the assigned floor area for this component if you want to assign a smaller floor area uh, for your specific example actually in this case I'm not going to assume that the corrugated floor slab is present everywhere I'm only assuming that uh, it's only present around the columns because if you uh, specify this as present everywhere this could uh, make the losses due to the slab damage very high because essentially the damage only happens around uh, near the columns uh, the damage in the slab happens around the columns so instead of 14,000 I will actually use 10% of this value which is only 1400 the location its floor and again typical and then I will keep 1400 instead of 14,000 I will override this value and then I will select add entry it's been uh, inserted into your defined component list now that you are done and you check everything and you make sure everything is correct 
then you click submit and now you have defined the component data now the next step that we need to do uh, notice now by the way that once you define the component data now the repair time scheme became active so you can click on the repair time scheme to check it so by default you will see here that the repair time scheme so the repair time scheme again as we mentioned before in the uh, quick intro uh, tutorial that this controls the repair time for your loss assessment so here I'm saying that repairing will happen sequential so meaning that you are going to repair each component in a sequential order so first you are going to repair the connections then you are going to repair let's say the columns then you are going to repair the beams then you are going to repair the suspending uh, suspended uh, ceiling then the drywall partitions and so on and so on if you want to modify this then you can modify this by saying for instance simultaneous that everything is going to be uh, repaired in the same time or if you want to say some component groups will be repaired simultaneously you can do that as well let's say that we are going to repair everything simultaneously so you can see here that all the IDs of your components are now located in one row all the ones that you defined so this means that all these components are going to be repaired uh, at the same time uh, you can also uh, specify whether the units of the same component at the given story floor will be repaired in parallel and so on you can read more about this in the manual and in the other quick intro videos but let's say that we are going to uh, be, uh, we are going to go ahead with this simultaneous uh, repair time scheme let me go ahead and click submit okay so now the third uh, compo uh, third uh, important part in my project definition is to define the response data and we mentioned that for this particular example that we have analyzed this building under 44 ground motion records at three different uh, seismic intensities which is basically three stripes so this means that if I click on response data the option that I will need to use is the second option which is defining data at multiple stripes and here I need to import the engineering demand parameter values from multiple ground motions scaled at multiple intensities which is our case so I will select this option and I will click next So the first thing that you need to do here is to browse for the Excel file that includes all the data for this multiple stripe analysis that you have conducted already. So this actually, you can for this, you can already use the, in the supporting document provided by ER, uh, if you go to template response data, multiple stripes, so this Excel file, so you need to open this file and you need to input the data yourself before you import it into R. So if I open this one, uh, actually the values that are already uh, shown in this template file are the ones uh, that are relevant to this uh, example building that we are uh, trying to analyze. So what you will find is the following. So I need to define a number of engineering demand parameters. Let's take, for instance, the two uh, engineering demand parameters, the story drift ratio, SDR, and the peak floor acceleration, PFA. So those ones you need to define for any type of projects. Those are the two main uh, engineering demand parameters for any uh, loss project. So let's start with the story drift ratio. So you will have sheets that are called SDR underscore one. So in this sheet, you need to input the story drift ratio data, the engineering demand parameters from your structure, from the, your numerical structure analysis at stripe one. 
then you have SDR underscore 2 from stripe number 2 and then SDR 3 from stripe number 3 if you have more stripes then you need to create uh, just another sheet that you can call it SDR underscore 4 and so on and so on so let's say SDR underscore 1 what values do you see here so you need to provide in each of those cells you need to provide at each story in my case I have four stories in my buildings so at each story I need to provide for each ground motion the value of the story drift ratio so in this case ground motion 1 scaled at intensity 1 which is stripe 1 the story drift ratio in the first story was around 0.63% radian in the second story it's around 0.57% radian third story 0.4% radian fourth story 0.24% radian so you need to start populating this data based on your analysis uh, then you keep doing this for all the ground motions so in my case I have 44 ground motion records so that's why I have 44 entries and you do the same for every seismic intensity or all, every uh, analysis stripe the same thing for the peak floor acceleration so I'm defining P in sheet PFA underscore 1 so right now I need to provide the peak floor acceleration values uh, these are of course the absolute values over here of acceleration not the relative ones so for each ground motion I need to provide the floor acceleration values at all floors and in this case since this is a four story building then you have a total of five floors then I put the values here and everything is in units of G for the story drift everything was in units in radians for the floor acceleration everything in G units the same thing for the second stripe and the third stripe now the question is if you have other uh, engineering demand parameters that you need to import then you can define those as well actually in this case if I'm looking at my components the list of components that I mentioned here the structure components and the non-structure components all these components are either dependent on the story drift ratio or the peak floor acceleration so I only need to define the story drift ratio and the peak floor acceleration as uh, my response data but in order later on because I need to uh, define as part of my project the demolition fragility which is the probability of demolishing the building as part of my loss assessment this demolition fragility is dependent on the residual drift ratio so I will select this here as an additional EDP that need to be imported from this Excel file which is the RDR or the residual drift ratio and again since I am going to import this then I will need three additional sheets RDR underscore 1, underscore 2, and underscore 3. And for each one of those, I need to define the value for the residual drift ratio for each ground motion. Now, you will notice here that you only provide one value instead of four values at each story. The reason is that when you are evaluating the demolition fragility, you don't care at the residual drift at each story you care only uh, for the maximum value out of all stories so this value here that we see here which is around 0.1 percent radian represent the maximum residual drift ratio of all stories when the building is subjected to ground motion number one scaled at seismic intensity one 
So the same thing I do for the second and the third stripes based on my structure analysis. So seems that everything has been defined here. Of course, if you have other things like you can define, like if you have a component that's dependent, for instance, on the peak floor velocity, then you will need to select the EDP here to be imported, and then you need to de create a new Excel sheet and populate the data in the Excel sheet and so on. But for my example here, I only need the storage drift ratio, the peak floor acceleration, and the residual drift ratio for the demolition. So I will close this file, and then I will say browse, and then I will go to the location where I have this file. Again, this file, you can name it, you can save it under any name. But in this case, I'm just going to import directly the one that we have into self-supporting documents. So I will click on a template, response data, multiple stripes. You will see that automatically, once Earl imported the data, it automatically uh, understood that the number of ground motions based on the size of the imported data, that it was 44. So this has been done automatically. You can modify this here. So for instance, you say, yeah, I already defined 44 entries, but actually I want to do the evaluation based on like the first 10. So you can do that. But in this case, let's keep it at 44. The number of stripes at this point, Earl doesn't know yet how many stripes you want to import. So you need, in this case, I will just need to say three. So based on this, when I click submit later on, Earl is going to go through SDR underscore one, underscore two, underscore three automatically, PFA underscore one, underscore two, underscore three automatically. So to import all the data. You need also to provide a value so since you have three stripes, so you need to provide what is the intensity level in units of G for each stripe. So here I'm going to use the values of 0.3G, which is representative of the seismic intensity for the first stripe, 0.6G for the second stripe, and 1.1G for the third stripe. Now everything is defined. You can click Submit. It and that's it. If you want to check that everything has been will be imported correctly, you can click on the plot ADP profile to see how things look like. So we can click on that. So right now we are going to get nine figures. The nine figures are basically the number of imported EDBs, engineering demand parameters, multiplied by the number of stripes. So, if I organize things here, you will see that you are going to get, again, these things here, these plots here. So, this plot, the last plots that are being generated, figure 7, figure 8, figure 9, one for the residual drift ratio, one for the peak floor acceleration, one for the story drift. So, this is at the stripe three uh, and you can see here for the story drift and the peak floor acceleration you can see the profile for each individual ground motion and you can see the median and the 16 and 84th percentile as a reference so you can look at the values and you check yes everything makes sense uh, and then if everything makes sense this means that everything will be imported correctly and then you can proceed so I can close all these uh, figures or I can save them maybe for reference later on. So I click submit. That's it. So now it's defined and you can see here it says multiple stripes. Uh, once you define the response data, now you can see that the remaining uh, sub options here are already uh, active, so you have the demolition and the collapse uh, uh, options are now active. Uh, 
let's actually uh, now define the demolition fragility if i click on this one so we mentioned that we are we want as part of our loss project we want to evaluate the losses associated with demolishing the building so i want to consider a univariate demolition fragility which is dependent only on the residual drift ratio which we already imported as a response data you need to specify the parameters of the demolition fragility basically the median value of the residual drift and the dispersion of the fragility function so in this example i'm going to use these values that i already have here i'm going to use 1.1 percent radian as a median and i'm going to use 0.25 as a dispersion if you want to see how this looks like you can click on plot fragility curve and you can see here this is the residual drift ratio and this is the probability of demolition as a function of the residual drift ratio so what this tells you is basically if you have a residual drift ratio of two percent roughly two percent or above this means that the probability of demolition will be one in this case so that looks fine i will click submit now it turns green so this means it's defined for the collapse fragility so right now you have imported data for three stripes but you haven't uh, provided any information about the probability of collapse of this building so if i click on the collapse module you can either say that i don't care about collapse that collapse will never will not happen in this case and i don't need to worry about it as part of my loss assessment so you can select no collapse if you want to consider it, then you need to provide, similar to the demolition, you need to define, uh, define a collapse fragility function. For this example, actually, just to show the complete uh, results at the end, I will going to define a collapse fragility function. And I'm going to, uh, based on my nonlinear analysis, I have observed that at the the largest seismic intensity which is strike three that some of the ground motions caused uh, some uh, collapse in my building so i noticed that the probability of collapse in this case was six percent at 1.1 g which is the intensity for stripe number three so using one point on the curve, which is 6% probability of collapse at 1.1 g, and specifying the uh, dispersion of this fragility curve, I will use a, a value of, uh, in this case, you can use uh, any value that you want, but for this case, I'm going to use 0.4, which is a typical dispersion value that results from record to record uh, variability. You can look into this into let in the literature so if i click on plot fragility curve again so this is the green point the one that we defined six percent probability of collapse at 1.1 g and using the dispersion value the third was able to uh, construct the collapse fragility curve which will have a median collapse fragility value of 3.05 g that looks fine i will click submit and that's it uh, the last thing that you need to define in my project which is optional you don't need to define it at this point you can go ahead and click compute but uh, the last optional uh, part of defining the project is to define the hazard uh, data the seismic hazard data so in this case i'm going actually to define the seismic hazard data again to show a complete example uh, as we, we mentioned like in the manual and uh, that you can do this by two options you can uh, use the integrated usgs hazard maps in earl by specifying the latitude and longitude of your location in the US in the Western United States 
and the period of the building and the velocity, the shear velocity of uh, the soil condition basically uh, of your uh, at your building, and then automatically uh, Perl will import or extract the hazard curve. Instead, you can have the data uh, already defined in a text file and then browse for it directly, which is actually what I was going to do in this example. If you go to the supporting document in R, you will see that I have this text file that's called template hazard curve. If I open it, it has two columns. The first column is the the first column is the seismic intensity and the second column is the mean annual frequency of exceedance. So I will go ahead and say browse. I will go to the location and select the template hazard curve. And now it has been imported. If you want to check how it looks like, you can click on plot hazard curve. So you can see here the red dots. These are basically the scatter of the imported data and they are being fitted automatically with a fourth order uh, polynomial, uh, which is the black line that you see over here. So that looks fine. I will say submit. Uh, once the project has been fully defined, you can also at any time as well, you can check the scope here to show the summary of the defined project. And then you can scroll, you can see summary for what you have defined in each of the uh, project uh, components with respect to the seismic hazard, with respect to the demolition and the collapse fragilities, uh, the response data, the component definitions, what kind of components are you including, so you can double check everything here. So we'll go ahead and click on uh, compute and for this project, we are going to use the FEMA P58 methodology. I'm going to use uh, Southend realizations as part of the Monte Carlo simulation procedure. I'm going to add an additional uncertainty to my the EDB values that I already defined. I'm going to add an additional cert uncertainty of 0.2. And this is to account for the uncertainty in the modeling, numerical modeling parameters. When I created this numerical model, I used the specific values to define the stiffness, the strength, the rotation, the ductility of each component. But of course, we know that there could be some uncertainty and variability with these values. So that's why here I'm adding this additional point two to account for this. Uh, I will also select that I want to compute the probability of issuing an unsafe placard to my building at a given uh, seismic intensity. And then everything is being defined. Then I will click and go ahead and say run. So what happens here that you can see that right now the program is running, you can see the progress bar. So now you're calculating the demolition loss at each stripe. Again, the analysis could take some time. Now it's calculating the repair losses. Uh, so it's going to do that for each stripe. At every, uh, at each uh, stripe you have southern realization. So now it's doing that for stripe number one. So skipping forward uh, to the end, we find that the whole analysis time is 1.8 minutes, which is uh, relatively uh, quick. Uh, actually, if you don't include the unsafe placard computation, uh, the analysis time would be uh, easily under uh, 30 seconds. So now that everything has been defined, you can see that now the visualization and the report buttons became active. So then Right now, we can go ahead and explore and visualize our data. So if I click on visualize, so you have all these options that are well described in uh, the manual, but I will go ahead 
and skip instead of looking at individual plots I will go to the summary plot which will give me summary of everything so I will click plot So as you see here, you have multiple tabs, and each tab has a different set of uh, plots. Uh, the first one, uh, right here, you can see the distribution of scatter of repair cost for each uh, realization. Here you can see the history uh, distribution of the repair cost. So you can see here that at Stripe 1, which is automatically which is selected here by default the mean uh, repair cost is around uh, 0.045 million dollars you can see here the distribution that at this specific realization which is the realization number 500 you will notice that at realization 500 the damage or all the losses are being contributed by the non-structured components that are drift sensitive and you can see the profile here along the height uh, if we want to see some damage so maybe we want to go to a higher stripe to see some damage and maybe see more uh, higher distributions so we can go to stripe number two or we can go to stripe number three maybe this is better then you can scroll across all realization. Uh, let's go, for instance, uh, to realization 494. So again, this realization, which is highlighted over here, so the repair cost from this realization is around two and a half million dollars. The contribution to this uh, loss is being contributed by the structure components, the non-structure components. The acceleration sensitive and the drift sensitive if you want to see exactly which component is doing that so you can go to the repair cost distribution and then you can see from this plot over here that it's the shear connection the rbs connection probably the yielding of these connections that are causing much of the repair uh, damage uh, cost the suspended ceiling and the wall partitions and the curtain walls in that order you can see the distribution across across the elevation of the building of the repair cost which stories were more vulnerable to losses and then you can of course tune your design maybe by increasing the stiffness or the strength of a particular story trying to reduce the acceleration or the drifts in this particular story or floor uh, trying to modify your component to avoid this damage which is basically the essence of a, the performance based uh, design approach over here you can see a summary of the collapse probability so at stripe 3 the collapse probability is 6.7 percent the demolition probability is 18.4 percent and the probability of issuing an unsafe placard is 6.5 percent and in this case uh, I'm actually there are no injuries and there are no casualties uh, of course you should note that if you run this analysis multiple times uh, these values which is the unsafe placard probability and the number of injuries and number of casualties could uh, vary slightly because this is uh, part of the Monte Carlo simulations and the random process of the Monte Carlo simulation. But in general, for this analysis that we conducted, I don't have any injuries and I don't have any casualties. I also see from this plot over here that the mean cumulative annual repair cost is $186 in this case. Uh, if I want to look at the repair times, so you can click on this tab so here you can see the distribution of the repair time so for instance uh, for the third stripe for the third stripe you should expect a mean repair time of about 40 days to repair all the damage in the building 
uh, at the last step you can check the generated EDPs in each realizations in each realization the generated EDPs distribution so you can look at the story drift ratio here at the first story you can see the distribution of the scatter based on the random Monte Carlo process uh, you can look at the third story for instance you can look at the peak floor acceleration so these are all the EDPs that we imported you can see the values how they change and so on and check that everything is makes sense all these uh, uh, history plots you can change them into a CDF plot by clicking here so all the figures can be transformed into an automatic cumulative distribution uh, function as you see here with a mean and standard deviation values highlighted so this is very useful of course so again from this loss plot you can look at all the data you can save the plot data if you want to look at the individual uh, figures by them by themselves you can uh, use these individual options here instead of the summary plot uh, you can normalize all the figures so instead of looking at the repair cost in million dollars if you want to see this normalized with respect to the uh, replacement cost of the building so you can click on check this box and now everything is a percentage of the cost which is again can be very useful and uh, with this i think we conclude uh, this example and you, as you can see you can uh, evaluate or the uh, and visualize all the lost data you can using a similar uh, one here you can use the report option to save the actual plot data into then if you can want to get the numeric data for these plots so you can select any plot that you want and you can click on generate report files to save this as a text data that you can later on process maybe in another uh, program or plot it in your own uh, style or preference you can also click on save raw data in order to save the entire uh, output of the Monte Carlo simulation in an organized uh, MATLAB array that again you can process or modify later on or do some post-processing yourself on it. So this is all well described into the ER manual and we are going to go through some of uh, these specifics in uh, other videos uh, down the road. So I hope this has been useful. So this is one way of defining uh, a project. Of course, there are many ways to define the response data. There are many ways to define the component data. We haven't uh, gone through each specific uh, option, but this is to give you a general uh, understanding of the entire procedure and uh, how easy it can be uh, in error. Thank you very much for your attention.